Let's pray. Oh Lord, your word is a light to our feet. It is what gives us truth. It is your own revelation of yourself and your thoughts and your ways, your plans, your commands for us. And we pray to live in the light of your word, uh, to follow you, implicitly trusting you as with childlike faith, walking in your ways. We ask even tonight as we look to your word together that you would be glorified, uh, that we would be edified, that your church would benefit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, This evening is our Off the Psalms night. We'll have a a variety of things in these slots. Uh, Our attempt is to sort of do four psalms in a row and then have a night where we sing together, uh, maybe have one of our seminary students preach, or as tonight, have a QA. and a so this is a, this is a Bible Q&A, uh, a couple of ground rules for you. This is not stump the elder night, right? So you cannot ask how many left-handed Benjamites could sling a stone and hit a hair um, or things like that. Uh, if you're live streaming and want to ask, uh, just text your question to Ben James at 2.30 a.m. and he'll be sure to answer those. Uh, now, Ben's got the mic, and uh, he's going to walk around. So if you have a question, just uh, slip your hand up. If, uh, if you're looking at a passage, tell us the passage you're looking at uh, nice and loud. But uh, we want to hear what's on your heart and, uh, and look at God's Word together if we can. Carla's got her hand halfway up. She's checking with Steve. Am I allowed to ask this question? She's not. She's not allowed to ask the question. Huh. Okay, I'll start with Madeline's question from this afternoon. Oh, Beth, did you have one? Corey has a question. No. Wait, I'm the one that's supposed to be shy about this. You're not supposed to be shy. So, um, I was wondering if you could tell us, what is the purpose of Samson? What is the purpose of Samson? What a, I like that question. I've never been asked that question. All right, let's turn to the book of Judges. I believe the book does tell us the purpose. So Samson's story is interesting to say the least. And uh, if you want a good summary of Samson's life, there is a musical version. uh, uh, J.G. Whitley put out a number of years ago. So you can sort of get the narrative. If you remember J.G., Uh, he put Samson's life to song. Uh, It's very entertaining. Uh, But Samson's life was not imitable. That is, uh, not to be imitated. Uh, We we get his story beginning here in um, Judges 13. Uh, The Philistines were oppressing Israel. And the time of the Judges was before Israel had a, a human king. And they had Judges. So they would... Uh, follow the Lord for a little while. They're in the land. This is after the conquest. They're in the land. They would disobey the Lord. They'd go after the gods of, of the pagan idolatries of the land. And then God would allow those pagan nations to oppress the Israelites. They'd cry out in their agony and God would raise up a judge who would deliver them. And there's a whole series of judges. Samson is one of the judges. And, and his story really starts uh, with his dad, um, and, and his dad gets to see the angel of Yahweh, which I believe is a pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity. Uh, he got to see God in human form. Uh, this is Christ before the incarnation. And then they give birth, he and his wife give birth to Samson. Samson grew up, according to the end of chap- uh, Judges 13, um, the child grew up, Yahweh blessed him, and the spirit of Yahweh began to stir him. And Samson was from birth a Nazarite. No razor had had touched his head um, and no alcohol uh, was to be taken in. And God raised up Samson to, number one, defeat the Philistines. These enemy pagan idolaters who were oppressing Israel. Uh, They needed to be delivered. God raised up a deliverer. And and Samson was was not the height of um, moral rectitude. Uh, he, he was a profligate sinner in quite a number of ways. 
Um, all his loyalties to the Lord for dietary restrictions were out the window. You remember he ate uh, honey out of the carcass of the lion. Uh, he was a cheater. He spent time with prostitutes. Uh, this, he was not a, not a great man. And yet, he was filled with the spirit of Yahweh to accomplish the things that Yahweh intends. So I think one of the purposes of Samson's life is to demonstrate that God uses sinful instruments to accomplish his purposes. And if he's going to human be- use human beings, he can only use sinful ones because there are no other kinds, save the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only human not to have sinned and lived his life out on the earth. So uh, the, the theme of the book of Judges, and this is stated several times in the book, but if you turn to the end of the book of Judges, Judges 21, verse 25, here's where we get, I think, the bottom line for why Samson, and and we would say, why Jephthah, why any of the judges, what's going on there? And and here's the statement, and the narrator statements in these narratives are really important. This is like zooming out in the Old Testament narratives, you get actions, Uh, You get activities, and some of them are good, some of them are bad, and they don't always come with an endorsement or a rebuke, right? We we should not take the, particularly the period of Judges, which was a downward spiral of national depravity and rejection of God, and then help, we need help, and then forget God and spiral down farther. We should not take any of the episodes in the book of Judges as, go therefore and do likewise, right? Jephthah's vow, where he kills his daughter. Uh, or uh, Gideon's fleece, where he tests the Lord by trying him with wanting some miracle to know what to do next. Those aren't good things, even though we've incorporated some of those things into our evangelical language. I put out a fleece. Uh, no, 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 don't, don't do that. <laughs> Why not don't do that? Um, Judges 21, 25 tells us, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Samson did what was right in his own eyes. Now, God was faithful to Israel and rescued Israel from her oppressors, but they were between kings. Why do I say they were between kings? Israel's original constitution was a theocracy with Yahweh as king. And the people said, no, 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 all the cool kids have kings. We want to be like the other nations. Their their king is a man who goes out and fights their battles for them. Yahweh says, I would have fought all your battles and won. Don't worry, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me as king. Um, and so they're between kings. Yahweh is king, and they don't yet have Saul, David, Solomon, and all the rest. So between them, you have the judges. No king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So Samson's life is one more episode in the downward spiral prepping us for the king who will be the rightful king over Israel and who will fulfill the promises God made. So, it, 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 judges, is a, is, there are lessons to learn from Samson's life, but the big lesson is uh, Israel needs the king. We're still waiting for him to reign. Steve, you've got Carla's question. Got to wait for the microphone. So Hebrews chapter 5, I think, um, says that the former priests could deal gently with the ignorant and misguided because they also were beset with weakness. And it seems like the application would be Christ is not beset with weakness, so he can't, but that seems like the wrong application. So I've never been sure how to, um, where, where, where to go with that statement. Okay, yeah, so this is Hebrews 5.2. Every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he also himself is beset with weakness. Um, One application that I think about from that verse is, oh, I need to be gentle with people. (laughs) If there's ever a place for a human who's a sinner, who has any place of authority or intermediary, a a dad in a home, a a pastor in a church, um, any kind of authority, or even just a friend, a counselor. Um, It is so easy for us to get on a high horse and feel judgmental towards others when they make mistakes. And and this is kind of a a backhanded indictment 
of a lack of gentleness in weak, human, frail, sinful servants of God on behalf of others. Uh, that's, that's one thought there. But obviously, the book of Hebrews is all about the superiority of Christ and the compare and contrast. Human high priests, and then there's Jesus, the one final high priest. And so, verse 3 continues, because of it, he is obligated, in other words, because of his weakness, the human high priest in the old sacrificial system, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. So the comparison is not, well, Jesus doesn't have to be gentle because he doesn't have any weakness. No, Jesus' sacrifice is better because he only has to offer it once. Um, that's the comparison. So um, he says... Um, Verse 5, Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. Uh, this was obviously given of God in the order of Melchizedek. Um, and he offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Um, and then you have the statement that because he was made perfect, uh, he's able to forever perfect those who have faith. Um, you have the weak, any weakness in Jesus is merely his humanity that culminated in his death. That produces for him a sympathy for us, uh, but it's a different kind than the, I'm weak because I'm sinful and I've got to help other sinners get to God. Steve, you, you remain with a puzzled look. <laughs> follow, follow, follow up your question. Does that line serve the argument then? Does the line serve the argument? Or is it just... Well, a vestigial appendage. There, there's, a, there's a lesser to the greater. It's not merely an appendage. So, and, it, and, it's, and it's not true that everyone who served as high priest actually dealt gently with those under their care. But they should have because they were sinners. Um, Jesus' sacrifice is better than theirs because it's one sacrifice for all time rather than always sacrificing. But we also notice that his gentleness is better than theirs. Everything about the book of Hebrews is about his superiority, superiority to the priests that came before. So it serves the argument. I don't think it's the main line of the argument. Oh. Jin Shaw. Oh. Thank you, Pastor Smelly, for answering my question. <laughs> so I was wondering um, about the covenant. Which one is for, you know, which one is conditional and which one is unconditional? Which one is um, for Israel and which one is good for us? Just like, you know, uh, 29, 11, I have a plan for you and not to um, harm you, but to give you uh, hope. So I know that one is, yeah, it's a little controversial. So I would just like to know more about the um, promise for us. Okay. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you, Jin Shaw. So we'll, we'll answer that in terms of like technical covenants in the Bible, which ones are conditional, which ones are unconditional. And then we'll talk more broadly just about promises. Um, how do I know I can take a promise for myself? Who's it for? Right? Is that a fair restatement of your question? So if you go to Genesis 12, um, you have this uh, unconditional covenant called the Abrahamic covenant. And this is where God promises to Abram, I'll make a nation of you. I will produce from you a people. I will give you a land uh, there will be rest, there will be blessing, uh, and then there will be blessing to all the families of the earth. That's Genesis 12, 1 and 2. And this is a unilateral promise of God to Abram and his descendants. This is reinstated in Genesis 15 and all through the book of Genesis to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob reinstated. And by unilateral, we mean it's a one-way covenant. God promises to do things and there's no... Uh, two sides of it. There's no, there's no bargain. There's no deal. And we see this played out in, in the way God um, uh, reinstates this covenant with Abraham. Um, when he causes Abraham to go to sleep. This is Genesis 15. We read in verse 6, Abraham believed Yahweh and Yahweh reckoned it to him as righteousness. Uh, this is a declaration of righteousness on the basis of faith. This is uh, gospel right here in Genesis. And he said, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. Abraham says, O Lord Yahweh, how may I know that I will possess it? 
And God reaffirms it here. In verse 9, he says, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought all these to him and cut them in two, laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses. Abram drove them away. When the sun was going down, verse 12, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. So God reinstates the covenant, and the the verb in Hebrew to make a covenant is literally the word to cut, to cut a covenant. And I I believe the, the Legacy Standard Bible actually translates it that way, to cut a covenant, to remind us how the covenants were made. And and the idea of cutting a covenant is you take an animal and you cut it in half, put the two halves on either side, and the two parties in an agreement walk together between the halves of the carcass. And the idea is, as you're walking between two halves of a dead animal, may what happened to this animal happen to me if if I break my end of the bargain. And what happens in this covenant is God puts Abram to sleep and God himself goes between the animals. He is telling us very clearly that Abram, you, a sinner, a human, and finite are not in a co-equal agreement with me. I'm making a promise that will not be violated. So there we get the idea of an unconditional covenant. Um, The other unconditional covenants that flow out of the Abrahamic are the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, where God promises that the, the, the kingdom the throne would come through not only the line of Judah, but specifically through the household of David. Um, and then the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, Deuteronomy 30, where God says, I will give you new hearts. I will circumcise your hearts. I will sprinkle your hearts clean with water. Um, all of those things are unconditional covenants God said he would do. Now, I will, um, I will say that each of these unconditional covenants come with conditions. Okay, um, turn to 2 Samuel 7. And this is where we have to be careful. Because even though God has made a unilateral promise that will not be violated, God will make from Abraham a great nation, give them a people, a land, rest, blessing to the nations, um, that God will come uh, through David uh, to produce the, the king and the kingdom forever to reign in Israel. And that God would take his people and give them a heart to love him from the heart. All those are unconditional promises. But they are conditional in the sense that the blessings are for the generation of Israelites that believe. And to whom are credited righteousness like to Abraham. Or the household of David. Which generation of the household of David will be the promised king to come? Well, that's conditional based on obedience. Um, which Israelites will be part of the regeneration, the, the national new covenant blessings? Well, those that believe during the great tribulation. Uh, we have an example of this conditionality within unconditional covenants in 2 Samuel 7. Verse 12. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And we might be tempted to think as as New Testament Christians, that's Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7. He will be the Davidic son that that establishes the Davidic throne. And then you get to verse 14. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and strokes of the sons of men. Wait a second. Wait, will Jesus sin? Jesus isn't the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7. What's going on here? And I think you have this, both the, the unconditional element that God promises a Davidic son who will hold the Davidic throne forever, and the condition of, wait, which son? Clearly is not Solomon. Solomon did build a house, but the, the, the line ended temporarily. There, 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 there's no Davidic son after the exile on the throne in Jerusalem over a united monarchy. In fact, the united monarchy dissolved after Solomon's day. Solomon was a sinner. Um, so it's not Solomon. And so the, the unconditional element of the Davidic covenant has us confident that God will keep his promise. The conditional nature of it has us asking the question, when? 
Who? And it builds our anticipation toward the Davidic son who will fulfill it. So we have the confidence God will do it and the conditionality of, ah, which generation? And when you get to the new covenant, are there Jews in the Old Testament who are saved by grace through faith? Yep, there's no other way to get saved. In other words, are there Old Testament saints who are regenerated, who experienced love from the heart that only God could produce that came through faith? Yes, um, but the, the unconditional promise of a national repentance is still to come. So take a Jeremiah 29, 11, for instance. Uh, here's a promise, um, not necessarily a covenant. By the way, as a contrast, the Mosaic covenant would be seen overwhelmingly as a conditional covenant. The Mosaic covenant is the stipulations, the constituted stipulations of the nation, the Ten Commandments and, and all the laws, 660 some laws under Mosaic Covenant that Israel was supposed to keep. Do these and you'll be blessed in the land. If you disobey these, you'll be cursed, you'll be exiled. But even that conditional Mosaic Covenant has unconditional elements, right? Deuteronomy 30, well, if you back up to Deuteronomy 10, in fact, you should turn there. Look at Deuteronomy 10. You have this command. God knows the problem in the human heart. Look at verse 12. Israel, what does Yahweh your God require from you? Fear him. Fear Yahweh your God. To walk in all his ways and love him and serve Yahweh with your God with all your heart and with all your soul. To keep Yahweh's commandments and his statutes which I'm commanding for you today. You get the sense that, that Moses is asking the rhetorical question. What does God want from you? Not much. Just everything. Just your whole life, your whole heart, uh, your, your obedience flowing out of the heart. And, and the ought, you should be giving God everything, is totally appropriate. Verse 14, behold, to Yahweh your God belong heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it. Think about the, the implication of that statement. Your heart should beat after Yahweh's heart. You should obey him all the time. You should walk in his rules. I, God was so gracious to, to give you his expectations for how to live life, and you should follow every rule to the letter. It's not that big a deal. Listen, every star in the universe obeys him. Every molecule on the earth obeys him, and everything in between, it all belongs to him. How much more should your heart belong to him? And he goes on, verse 15, on your fathers did Yahweh set his affection to love them. Of all the things in the universe, of all the peoples on the earth, God picked out Israel and he chose their seed after them, even you above all peoples as it is to this day. So, verse 16, here's the big therefore, circumcise your heart, stiffen your neck no longer. God, God diagnoses their problem. You've got a hard heart. It is the, the cause of, of the sin, and it needs a supernatural solution. God is commanding them to have something done to them on the inside, a supernatural surgical procedure on the heart that they can't do. Wait, is that unfair of God to command me to do something I'm unable to do? No, you must be born again. It's the same command. That's why Nicodemus stumbled over that one. I, uh, this command in Deuteronomy 10 gets answered in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Here at the end of, of Moses' final message to the people. And sometimes we read Deuteronomy, 30, or Deuteronomy 10 and Deuteronomy 30, 20 days apart from each other. Or if you're in a chronological Bible, maybe a, a week apart from each other. But it was all one sermon. And here's the promise. This is an unconditional promise in the midst of a conditional covenant, the Mosaic covenant. Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. That is the first utterance of the new covenant. It's echoed in Jeremiah 31. It's echoed in Romans 11:27 or Zechariah 12:10. It's echoed in the song of Isaiah 53 when the Israelites will sing this nationally. But here's the promise. God says, you must circumcise your hearts. And then he says in the end, I'll do it. So even in the 
conditional covenant, you have unconditional promises. And in the unconditional uh, covenants, you have conditional elements. So Jeremiah 29, 11, let's set the context for that one just a little bit. Here, the people are in exile. Uh, Daniel has been serving the people in Babylonian exile. Uh, God has uh, given word to the people through Jeremiah uh, from Jerusalem and then to Daniel in Babylon. Live in Babylon. Pray for the place where you're at. Um, Stay there and live. Uh, I, I have promises for you. And it is very likely that Daniel was reading this text as he's waiting out his time in Babylonian captivity and encouraging the people. So back up to Jeremiah 29, 10, for thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. That is back to Jerusalem. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. And of course, in Daniel 9, Daniel refers to these very words, probably opens his windows toward Jerusalem and prays. This promise is a specific one for a specific people in a specific time. And anytime you have a pronoun, do you know what a pronoun is, it's the you, he, she, it, I, they, them, Uh, those pronouns in the Bible, I would encourage you, work hard from the context to fill in the referent of the pronoun. Uh, That is, who's, who's the you here? And fill it in with the people. And the you here in this text, very clearly, are the Jews in exile in, in Babylon, that God is making a promise to. He says, I know the plans I have for you. What are those plans? He tells us right here in verse 10. 70 years of captivity in Babylon and then home to Jerusalem. And I'm going to prosper you and bless you. Now, if you have Jeremiah 29, 11 cross-stitched on your living room wall, I'm not going to ask you to take it down. Even though I know that is commonly used to say, God says he knows the plans that he has for Smedley, for financial prosperity, a good job, everything to go well, no car troubles, and no sickness. Jeremiah 29, 11. Is that what that verse means? No, what the verse means is God promised the Jews in exile in Babylon that they should trust him because he's got a plan and he's going to bring them back after 70 years and they're going to prosper. That's what it means. Now, is there significance for us in this? Did God keep that promise? Yep. He kept his promise. Historically, it's done. He's good on his promises. Well, then it doesn't mean anything for me. No, it means everything for me. I can trust God. He made a promise to Israelites in Babylonian captivity, and he kept it in real life history. So I can bank on his promises. Can I bank on his promise that God will prosper me in Babylonian captivity? No, no, no. It's not specific to me in that way. But it is a window into the character and heart and reliability of of my God. And I can trust him. Matthew. Oh, you got one? Okay. I just, I, I have a terrible time keeping Israel... And Judah separated. Okay. Why? And does God still like Judah? (laughs) Okay. Great question. Yeah. So Israel is the name that God renamed Jacob. You have Abraham. Of course, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. You'll be a father of many nations. Uh, Abraham's son, Isaac. Isaac's son, Jacob. Do you remember the scene that Jacob wrestled with God and God renamed him Israel? So Israel, we think of Israel today as a place on a map. It's a country. It's the, the, the people of God's promises in the Old Testament. Um, but Israel, in its first usage, was just Jacob's new name. And it literally means he wrestles with God. And so when we think of Israel, we think of Jacob. It's sometimes in the Bible, the, the nation of Israel is just called Jacob as an interchange. And then Jacob had 12 sons. Uh, one of those sons is Judah. 
So Judah is one of Israel's sons. Judah is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Judah became the, the hub of the southern tribe. So the 10 northern tribes went off into Assyrian captivity. And then, you know, the, the division of the land. Then finally, uh, the southern tribes went off into Babylonian captivity. They've never been back together yet in a unity under a monarchy in the land. They've never yet had sovereignty in the land as the tribes under a king the way God promised. So there's still a future for Israel as the nation and for Judah as a tribe within the nation. So maybe you think of it as um, America and Texas. <laughs> Is that fair? All right. Matthew, and then Lori, try to keep these in order. And yes, my heart is racing a little bit faster. I know the kinds of questions Matthew Pruitt will ask me. Just a forewarning, I'm about to step on a lot of people's toes. When it comes to the major prophets, Isaiah is my least... Uh, favorite, and not for the reason you would expect. I love all the high points that many people would say, like, uh, your sins are a scarlet brow, make them as white as wool, and then the, uh, we looked on him who has pierced. I often find it's very repetitive compared to the other major prophets, because usually there's a lot of single themes, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. They don't get repeated a lot, but in Isaiah, they get repeated quite often. Is it because of how early Isaiah is? Because it's before all the major kings started taking away the kingdoms? Okay, Matthew, you, you didn't let me down. Um, that is a question I've never heard before. And you did step on toes, though probably only Isaiah's toes. And he's not here to be offended. Um, <clears throat> so maybe I'll broaden your question out a little bit. Um, and this could apply to any book and any of us in the room. Um, why is a certain book of the Bible written the way it's written? Uh, why does this go on and on and on about whatever? Um, for you, it's Isaiah and he's repetitive. Um, for some of us, it's the book of Numbers. And uh, why, why, why do they just keep doing circles in the desert? I'm tired of this. They were tired of it. I'm tired reading about it. Um, and, and so we, we sort of have these questions. Um, I don't think they're always irreverent. Um, I mean, you, you could come from a heart of, of doubt and, uh, and uh, judging God for the way he wrote the Bible. But I think the heart behind the question you're asking is, there's a reason that Isaiah is repetitive, and I want to know what that is. Why is it like that? And for some of us, we hear something once, and it sticks, we remember it for a lifetime, we apply it to every element of our lives, and we obey the Lord on the basis of it. And others of us need to hear it again and again and again. I think that might get at why some of the refrains, not just in Isaiah, but in many of the prophets, um, are recurring. It's helpful. And it's a window into the Bible. It's as if God knows our hearts. There are so many angles on our nature, on our sin, on our proclivities. It's as if God knows the way that we're built. There's not just one way to talk about Jesus died for my sins. There's a hundred ways. There's not just one way to analyze pride in the Bible and, and promote humility. There are a lot of ways. There's, there's not just one way to, to address sin in general. Sometimes it's narrative. Sometimes it's poetry. Sometimes it's open rebuke. And so God knows what we need. And reading the Bible over and over and over again uh, gives us a little window into all those different angles we need. Some of us need the repetition. Fair. <laughs> all right. We'll go to Lori and then back to you, Carol. Every time I read Malachi, and, I, and it ends kind of, in my opinion, a little curious, like... Oh, um, now we're stepping on Malachi's Malachi types. 4, six, six short verses, but I don't quite understand how um, Elijah 
restores the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Okay. And then, boom, it's done. So End of the Old <laughs> Testament. Yeah. Boom. 400 years of silence, waiting to see what God will do. This is so fascinating. If you think about Malachi 4 and Matthew 11, these are like the, the two sides of the teeth in a zipper. And, and when you put these things together, it's like your Bible just zips up together in a, in a, a seamless unity. Um, turn to Matthew 11. There are a number of these places where you get the seams between the Testaments that just help us understand New Testament, Old Testament. It's one book, all written by God. It's all telling the same story. And Jesus is speaking. Jesus in verse 7 says to the crowds about John the Baptist, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Um, and so what you have here at the end of the Old Testament is this promise that someone is coming to prepare the way of Yahweh. And then Yahweh himself comes in the flesh and the forerunner comes too. What was John's job um, in, in the mode of Elijah the prophet? Um, to restore hearts of fathers to their children and hearts of the children to their fathers. Um, you're emphasizing, Lori, parental and child reconciliation. Um, and, and sometimes we get a different sense when we emphasize a certain word in a verse. So if I read it this way, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so I won't come and smite. Um, we might get a sense that that's the emphasis. If I read it this way, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he'll restore the hearts of the children to their fathers. And I think I would read it that second way in the sense that family restoration is going to be a fruit of heart restoration nationally. What will happen in homes when all, all the heads of households in Israel follow Yahweh. Well, that's going to have generational blessing. And, and what's stunning is when you get to Romans 1, and Paul is describing the state of the world when Messiah came, Romans 1 ends with this massive vice list. And one of those things in that vice list, after the downward spiral of human depravity, is they are disobedient to their parents. And you just think, oh, what would the gospel fix? The, the heart problem that produces family troubles. And what's interesting about the, the role of John the Baptist as it relates to the Elijah promise. What does Malachi 4 say in verse 5? I am going to send you, who's the you? Israel. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of Yahweh. We talked about it this morning. The, the day of the Lord is this broad day of the Lord sometimes in Scripture that encompasses everything from the beginning of the tribulation period all the way through the eternal state. And sometimes the day of the Lord describes something more narrow. The great and terrible day of the Lord, I believe, is a technical designation for what happens in Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back to the earth, wipes out the enemies of Israel, rescues Israel militarily, just after they have believed in him nationally. And so Elijah the prophet has a role just before the, the great and terrible day of the Lord. In what sense is John the Baptist a fulfillment of Elijah? The, the New Testament says, this is who John the Baptist is. Uh, this again is one of those conditional, unconditional realities in uh, in our Bibles. Hmm. 
I'm not sure I can. Oh, okay. Here it is. It's also in Matthew 11. Look at verse 14 of Matthew 11. The, the details of this are so fascinating. If you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. What, what is this? What is this? Prophetic fulfillment dependent on the reception of the people who experience it? Yes. I believe this is an indication of Jesus' offer of the kingdom to Israel in his day. And if they would have accepted Jesus as king, then John the Baptist would have been Elijah the forerunner in complete fulfillment of that day of the Lord where the king comes back, lays waste to the enemies, establishes the kingdom, and reigns on David's throne for a thousand years. He would have been. And they rejected him, and so he's not. I don't know if you ever noticed that little if in Matthew 11. Um, but this is a, a, a stunning little detail about John the Baptist and Elijah and the offer of the king, the presentation of the king. Uh, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is in your midst. Why? Because the king himself is present. And what did they do with the king? No, we don't want you. They killed the king. And so Jesus tells parables about a king came, rejected by his subjects, goes away for a long time, and then comes back angry. <laughs> and that's how it turns out. Now, this, is, this, of course, is not plan B for God. God knew they would reject. It was Jesus' plan to go to the cross, lay down his life, and actually purchase redemption for all who would believe at the cross. Um, but from a human standpoint, God offering the kingdom to Israel who would reject it. And along with that, the offer of the forerunner of the king and the kingdom, Elijah, John the Baptist. So since John the Baptist doesn't fulfill all the elements of that, just like Jesus' first advent, advent doesn't fulfill all the promises of Messiah's coming, only the suffering servant ones, there will be another coming of Elijah as forerunner before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Was that more than you bargained for? Okay. All right, uh, back to Carol. More practical question. Um, how do you rightly evaluate your usefulness to the Lord in humility? Particularly, how do you discern what like, abilities or gifts to desire to employ to its like, quote-unquote maximum versus those that it would actually be glorifying to God to hold back on so that our self doesn't get like, in the way or distracting? I'm particularly thinking about um, 1 Corinthians 14 for like, desiring uh, spiritual gifts versus also um, 1 Corinthians 2 saying, I, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified and I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling and my speech and message were not in plausible works of wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. So, like, kind of, does that make sense? Like, um, Your question yeah. makes sense, Carol, and your own answer to your own question makes even more sense. <laughs> very, very insightful. Can I restate your question? I want to be useful to the Lord. There are spiritual gifts. How do I make sure I'm not uh, proud, self-centered, getting myself in the way of the use of spiritual gifts? Um, was that sort of your question? Sure. I, I think more like seeking to employ them versus holding back. Like what, how do you discern what okay. glorifies God? Okay. So, uh, I don't want to hold back spiritual gifts. They're designed by God to be employed in the church. How do I do that? Well, how do I know what they are? How do I not misuse them? I want to be useful. Something along somewhere in there. Okay, the, the answer you gave to your own question, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 14, and I'll add to that Romans 12, um, are spot on. So if, if we look at the, the spiritual gifts sort of sandwich, this is 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And it's just fascinating the way this is built. 1 Corinthians 12 is about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 is about the use of spiritual gifts. 
And this was a letter written to Corinth. This is early in the New Testament. This is early in the apostolic era. This is a period of time before much New Testament has been written. And God is actually governing the church through supernatural signs and wonders and miracles and revelatory gifts. By revelatory gifts, I mean God speaks and prophets say, thus saith the Lord, and it is inerrant. Uh, Someone gets a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge as direct revelation for the Lord to be applied to a specific situation, and it is from the Lord. Why? Because they didn't have Romans. They didn't have 2 Corinthians. They didn't have Ephesians. They didn't have the other books of the Bible to guide the Christian life. This was a transitionary period. And what the Corinthian believers had done is taken their supernatural gifts that they could use at will, some of them, Uh, Some of them were probably more spontaneous, but some of them able to to use at will, and they were showing off. So take the the gift of tongues, for instance. That's the supernatural ability to speak languages you've never studied. Could you imagine if you had that gift? What would the temptation be like for uh, an immature, flesh-driven believer with a gift like that? Watch this. Japanese. Uh, that is what they were doing. And so the 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 come as a correction. What is the purpose of spiritual gifts? Uh, look at verse 18 of chapter 12. God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. Down to verse 24. God has so composed the body, giving honor to some that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have care for one another. And then he gives a list in verse 28. God has appointed in the church first apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, administrations, languages. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. So there's an encouragement, and Paul affirms this encouragement in 1 Thessalonians, don't despise the prophetic utterances. If God gives you a prophecy, if God says, thus saith the Lord, and You're supposed to say it. You were supposed to say it in the era where prophecy existed. If you had a word of wisdom, you were to say it. Uh, Tongues had a place and a purpose. And the interpretation of languages had a place and a purpose. But the moment we start getting self in the mix, we pervert the gift. We misuse the gift. Which is why when you get to chapter 14, Paul says like in verse Uh, 12, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Verse 19, in the church I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So it's this encouragement on the one side, the Holy Spirit gives gifts for the benefit of the church. If you're not using your gifts, the church isn't built up. Use your gifts. And if you're using your gifts for the building up of self, you're doing it wrong. Don't do that. And the way this section is built, 12, 13, 14, what do you have in 1 Corinthians 13? Oh, a a detour about marriage. No, no, no. No, the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 is the meat of the gift sandwich. Corinthian believers, you've got gifts. You're using them wrong because you don't love. Let me show you a better way. You better learn how to love one another because some of these things are going away. That's the point of 1 Corinthians 13. And so, uh, Carol, you pointed out 1 Corinthians 2. Paul clearly had gifts. He was an apostle, teacher. Um, He spoke in tongues more than anybody else, he says. Paul clearly had gifts and he used them. He had prophetic and revelatory and healing gifts. But notice what he says. This really goes all the way back to 1 Corinthians 1, 18. The word of the cross is foolishness to the perishing, to us who are being saved is the power of God. Paul embraced the foolishness, from the world's perspective, of the message of the cross in chapter 1. And Paul embraced the foolishness of the method of proclaiming the cross in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Some people would say, well, 
Paul didn't speak eloquently like the, the speakers, the orators that, that the, the Corinthians loved because he couldn't. No, I believe Paul, as a very educated man, could have but didn't because he did not want people to trust in his abilities rather than in the message of the cross and the method of proclaiming the cross, which is an unadorned, not going after entertainment, not style for style's sake to impress you with oratory. Everybody come pay to listen to me. No, Paul said, I'm not taking pay and I'm not trying to impress you. Embrace the foolishness of Jesus crucified and embrace the foolishness of an unadorned proclamation of it. There you have a very gifted man running away from the showy expression of his gifts for the simple proclamation of truth. And Paul is actually embodying what he will say to the Corinthian believers about their own gifts. Be useful to the church. Use your gifts. God placed them there on purpose. And use them well. And that leads me to the, one of the other gift lists. This is in Romans 12. Flowing out of the mercies of God and presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, not being conformed to the world. And then he says in verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith, just as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Here's your use usefulness. If prophecy, prophesy according to the proportion of faith. If service, in serving, if teaching in his teaching, in exer if, you ex if he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheer cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy. So what is your usefulness as it relates to spiritual gifts? Well, go and serve the body of Christ. I think you will find ways that the Holy Spirit has placed in you things that you love to do, that you're good at, that bear fruit. Uh, when I was in Bible college, we, we took spiritual gift inventories with a list of all the spiritual gifts from the New Testament, maybe a few extra ones sprinkled in. Check the box which ones you have. Uh, there's always some guy in the crowd that says, I have the gift of admonishment, and he runs around criticizing everybody. <laughs> right? Uh, but your youth, usefulness, not youthfulness, your usefulness will be found in just obeying what God says to obey, and I think you will gravitate to the areas that God has supernaturally gifted you by the Holy Spirit because he sovereignly composes the body with varying gifts. We're not the same. We're different. We do different things on purpose by God. We don't despise one another, and you just jump in and serve, and I think you find what you're good at, what you love, and what the Holy Spirit chooses to uh, produce useful fruitfulness through your life. Carol, does that get at what you're asking? How do you discern, like, what gift you have? No, no, I mean, like, just... Or whether you're useful. You know what you're good at? There's an easy way to determine your usefulness. Super easy way. Um, walk outside, get hit by a bus, wait for the Bama Seat Judgment. There, everything will be revealed. And the dross, the hay, the wood, the stubble that you built with will be burned away and you won't miss it. You'll say, oh, praise the Lord. None of that stuff belongs in here. And the stuff that remains is the stuff that only God could produce. And then he will reward you for it. He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And Carol, you will say, wait a second. All this stuff you're rewarding me for is the stuff that you produced. And, and, and you may be tempted to say, why are you rewarding me for the stuff you did, God? Because God gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. And only the stuff he does lasts. Until then, do we know? Mm. I'm not sure I can discern what is wood, hay, and stubble, and what is precious stuff that lasts. There's too much selfishness in me. All right. Okay, one more question. Okay, you, two more questions. We'll, we'll do two more. So, in Exodus 34, 6, 
um, the declaration of God's character to the people. He talks about how uh, the inequity is going to go to the third and fourth generation, to the children and the children's children. Um, who forgives inequity, transgression, and sin, yet he will not, by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the inequity of the fathers on the children and the, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. So I just kind of wanted to hear your take on that. Okay. Um, two answers to this. Um, sometimes the Bible says two different things that seem like a contradiction, right? There are sometimes, uh, the, the Bible says, nobody's punished for his dad's sins, Nobody's punished for his kid's sins. And here, uh, iniquity or the consequences of iniquity are passed down generationally. By the way, both of those can be true. Generational consequences for sin and redemption from those generational consequences from sin have been experienced probably by everybody in this room. And every man stands alone at the final bar of judgment. So that's one side of things, dealing with what theologians call an antinomy, an apparent contradiction. It's not a real contradiction. It's like in Proverbs, when you see answer a fool according to his folly, don't answer a fool according to his folly, back to back. They're, they're, both of those are true in their, own, in their own way, in their own time. But in Exodus 34, this text gets to the problem of the Bible and points us to the solution. So in verse six, you have Yahweh passed by in front and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, chesed or grace, the Old Testament word for grace and truth. God keeps grace, loving kindness for thousands. He forgives iniquity. He forgives transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave unpunished. Whoa. That's an antinomy. Um, The word guilty in the New American Standard translation is an addition. The translators have put those words in there. You know that by the italics. I don't think those words should be in there. I think you should read this verse simply. God forgives sins, yet he will by no means leave unpunished. Whoa, uh, is God schizo? What, what, does, this, what does this mean? He, he forgives sin and he punishes every sin. This gets to the problem of humanity, the problem of God, the problem of the Bible. Listen, if I'm a Jew without a New Testament and I come to Exodus 34, 7, I have a real problem reading this in Hebrew. There's no solution to this unless you believe Jesus, the son of David, the son of Mary in Bethlehem went to a cross and suffered as a substitutionary ransom payment for the sins of all who would believe. This points to the gospel. How can God forgive sin and yet punish every sin? Only if Christ, God himself in the flesh, is the intermediary. Listen, if you're a Christian, it's not as if your sins don't get punished. Every sin gets punished. Every sin you've ever committed, Christian, every sin you're committing now, every sin you will ever commit gets punished. God will not leave it unpunished. And yet he forgives. What does that mean? The gospel just means you don't get punished for your iniquity. Someone else did. Exodus 34, 7 is a setup for the whole storyline of the Bible. It's not a contradiction. Um, And and then it includes, obviously, the the generational consequences uh, of guilt and sin. And so uh, this is just one of those Old Testament hints that's pointing our anticipation and hope towards the cross work of Christ. All right, last question. Uh, right in front of you. And tell us your name, first and last name. Uh, first name, Fernando. Oh, last yes, name, Fernando. Guardado. Um, I'm just thinking about what you mentioned earlier on keeping in mind the pronouns that are used. Reading Matthew 19, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he says, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Um, does this include Judas, given in context that he is speaking to the disciples? Yeah, great question. Um, no, it doesn't include Judas. Uh, Judas uh, clearly is an unbeliever. Jesus sees it from the beginning. He calls him the son of perdition. And he actually says, woe to you. It, this must come, but woe to you through whom it comes. It would be better for you never to have been born. Um, so Jesus is clearly declaring the, the secret insider um, in league with Satan, uh, who's going to defect and betray. Um, but his identity and his plan was unknown. Even at the Last Supper, the disciples are saying, is it I, is it I, is it I? And nobody suspected Judas. But Jesus knew from the beginning. When Jesus uses the you, or in Texan, y'all, here, um, it is this collective identity for him to say, you disciples of mine, specifically the, the disciples who will be the apostles, you will sit on 12 thrones. Um, and so I think it's appropriate for him to, to say that then. He doesn't give the little footnote asterisks. Uh, all of you, but you, not you. It's not time for him to reveal that. Um, but collectively, the apostles will sit on thrones. Um, this is a comfort to them for the persecution they'll face. Uh, this cuts out their uh, selfish ambition. Who's the greatest? Who's the best? All that kind of stuff. They, they fight over that all the time. And Jesus is assuring them um, that they have a unique place and a unique role in the kingdom to come. Now, your question, Fernando, raises other questions for me that I don't have an answer to. Jesus clearly says 12 thrones. Um, who sits there? The 11 plus Matthias is it 11 plus Matthias plus Paul? Is Barnabas a little A possible that goes along with? Are there, do, do, is, is one of those thrones like a two-seater? I don't know how all that works. Um, but I think it's appropriate for Jesus to use the collective for them, even in his own mind, knowing Judas is excluded. It's kind of like all the New Testament letters. Uh, for instance, the, Paul's letters, he writes to a mixed audience, and he'll affirm in the letter, say to the Corinthians, all of you are filled with the Spirit, you have gifts, you're useful, I love you, and there are promises from God and guarantees of eternal security and all the rest. And then he says things like, examine yourself, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. There's this collective y'all, Texan, um, and then the exceptions sort of footnoted in there. So... Great question. Thanks for this evening, and uh, I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for knowing us better than we know ourselves, for rescuing us from our slavery and darkness and rebellion, for meeting our greatest need at the heart level, and ultimately for the good news of the gospel, which is bringing us to you. We get our sins forgiven at the cross so that we can know you, which is eternal life. Oh, do we look forward to an unmixed condition, the end of the fight with sin, the world made right, and best of all, being in your presence forevermore. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.